Recording in progress.
aprobar interpretación aprobamos español siguiente que eh, una sola español una ya lo ya un minuto que estamos todavía con la ponencia Perfecto, gracias doctor.
Muy buenos días a todos y todas. Expreso un cordial saludo a la distinguida representación de las presuntas víctimas, a la delegación del ilustre Estado de los Estados Unidos. Voy a dar por abierta la audiencia en este caso, el caso 14.543. Mostafa, Seyed, Mirheit y otros respecto de Estados Unidos. Voy a cederle la palabra al secretario ejecutivo adjunto, Jorge Mesa, para que haga la referencia particular sobre este caso. Muchas gracias, vicepresidenta. Muy buenos días. El presente caso se relaciona con la alegada responsabilidad de los Estados Unidos por la presunta detención arbitraria de los hermanos Mohamed Reza Mirhendi y Mostafa Mohsen Mortaba, todos Seyed Mirhendi, en el marco de su presunta participación en una manifestación, lo que a su vez habría derivado en las alegadas violaciones al debido proceso, la igualdad ante la ley, la libertad de expresión, el reconocimiento de la personalidad jurídica y a sus derechos de reunión y asociación establecidos en la Declaración Americana. La Comisión Interamericana notificó su informe de admisibilidad el 21 de abril de 2021. La parte peticionaria, por su parte, presentó sus alegatos respecto del fondo el 20 de octubre de 2021 y el Estado ha presentado sus observaciones adicionales el 29 de julio de 2022. Esta audiencia tiene por objeto recibir las declaraciones de dos presuntas víctimas y profundizar los… Ok, we can go. Ok. Decía, por último, que la presente audiencia tiene por objeto recibir las declaraciones de dos presuntas víctimas y profundizar los alegatos de fondo de ambas partes. Gracias, vicepresidenta. Gracias. Eh, en primer lugar, la comisión escuchará el testimonio de la presunta víctima Mostafa Sayed Mirmeit, perdonen la pronunciación, eh, que ha ofrecido la parte peticionaria. El testigo declarará sobre su experiencia en detención, las presuntas violaciones a la libertad de expresión y el debido proceso, el impacto en su vida como consecuencia de las presuntas violaciones a los derechos humanos y las reparaciones que considera necesarias. La parte peticionaria tendrá 10 minutos para realizar el interrogatorio. Posteriormente, el Estado, si así lo estima pertinente, tendrá 10 minutos para el interrogatorio a la presunta víctima. Y finalmente, la Comisión realizará las preguntas al declarante. Señor declarante, sírvase indicar su nombre completo, su lugar de nacimiento y lugar de de residencia. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Mohsen Sayed Mirmedi. I was born in Iran and I live in the United States, California. Vamos a, a dar entonces inicio al interrogatorio por la parte peticionaria y las respuestas del de señor declarante. Por 10 minutos. Thank you, Mayor Mart. Thank you very much, President. Good morning to the commissioners. Good morning to the Executive Secretary of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, the USA Government Delegation, and those present in this hearing. I'm Paula Angarita. I'm going to be the, do the questions. Mosin, what were the reasons that you decided to move to the United States? I believe in freedom and democracy. And uh, the reason I came here is that uh, we had a lot of problems in my country. My parents uh, were against the government. Uh, we 
we were subjected to persecution over there. Uh, one of my brothers, Mushtaba, he was imprisoned in Iran for over three years because he attended a demonstration against the Iranian government. It was a peaceful demo demonstration for freedom and democracy. There was a crackdown on all the politi political groups at that time. Uh, my, uh, um, my brother, he was tortured. Uh, we were all uh, subject to investigation and inspection and uh, harassment. Uh, our house was raided at, at least a couple of times by the U.S. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, by by Iranian government. Uh, I did not uh, go to any political. Uh, I did not go to the war. Uh, I didn't join the army. Uh, I was against war with uh, with Iraq, and I wanted peace for my country. Uh, they took me. Uh, they didn't let me to get to university, so I had no chance to. To, for education, uh, uh, for all these reasons, also I could not speak my, my thought. I was uh, I was feeling getting suffocated in my country uh, because of all that. Uh, we didn't really feel safe. Also, uh, something else I should tell you that revolutionary guards. We have we had some revolutionary guards in my street. They were always harassing us. They used to write anti. Um, uh, anti-American, like death to America uh, slogans uh, in the wall of our house. They knew that one of my brothers was in U.S., so they felt that uh, we are pro-Western uh, and pro-U.S. Uh, uh, they used to say anti-death, uh, uh, they used to write death to uh, anti-revolution. Uh, anti so we were all subject to humiliation and everything else. So that's why after the war ended, I, I attended, uh, I joined the army, I got my, my passport and I, I, I got out of the country. Uh, I was not feeling safe and I could not even breathe there anymore. Did you participate in any freedom of expression or each speech once here? Did you advocate for democracy here in Iran here? Yes, uh, I mean that was my whole intention was to get here to be able to talk and 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 speak uh, my my idea and 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 for freedom and democracy, uh, uh, and it was my absolute right, uh, which is uh, protected under First Amendment to get here. And uh, I feel even though I left my country, I felt for my for my for my for my compatriot back home. And I wanted them to be free. I was, I felt that I I can be a voice of my my own people. That's why I attended a couple of demonstrations here in U.S., which was uh, permitted and legal. And uh, and uh, I will do if I have to. I will do. It's my, it's absolute my right to 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 practice my First Amendment right here. What happened when you were detained in two thousand one? Uh, let me uh, let me just uh, go back a little bit. Uh, in 1999, we were arrested the first time, uh, an immigration violation. My fake attorney was arrested, and he was uh, sentenced. After six months, we got released uh, without any due process. We got released with high bonds, which is unusual, which, uh, because we didn't do anything wrong ourselves, and we don't have any criminal history or record. After 2001, unfortunately, that, uh, that tragedy of September 11 happened that was very heartbreaking for everybody. Uh, uh, and I didn't know that I can be a casualty of post 9-11 myself. I, I, I'm a victim of 9-11 myself, I mean, the, the other casualties. Uh, I was going to my office, a red, uh, a white Ford car uh, was following me, and uh, and I felt that somebody is following me. So they did stop me, and it was uh, there were some FBI agents. They took me. Uh, they asked me to get out. Uh, they asked me if I do I have do you have weapon uh, ammunition? I said no. I'm a peaceful person. I, what's going on? They said you're getting uh, arrested. I said why? I I had my bond. I was going to my immigration courts. I have. Uh, valid uh, uh, work permit, I have no violation. They said, no, you're a terrorist. We have to take you. 
So they took me to their car, and um, I remember they asked me about my brother, Mustafa, and I told him that he doesn't live with me. They said, no, no, let's go to your home. They took me to my home, and uh, while uh, we, we, when we arrived, they put a shotgun on, on my head, and they said that uh, just uh, uh, shot your ask your brother to get out. I told him he doesn't live with me. Go ahead, sh uh, ask him to get out. We know he is here. So I was shouting and yelling at my brother. I mean, he was not there. I knew that M Mustafa, please get out. They're going to kill you. If you don't get out, they're going to kill you. And meanwhile, I had a shotgun on my head. And it was very uh, scary and horrible, uh, horrible uh, experience. So anyway, uh, there was no answer. So they said they want to. So anyway, I opened the door and they got in. They searched the house. No, there was nobody. They searched even the, the garage. Uh, they did, uh, and, uh, and he was not there. So anyway, I, I was taken to custody, uh, and uh, I spent uh, 41 months in detention, uh, 20 months in uh, solitary confi confinement in, uh, in, San uh, in, in Santa Ana Jail. Uh, about a month uh, with uh, all gangbangers and criminals in uh, in county jail in Las Vegas, and about 20 months in um, uh, in San Pedro jail. Uh, what were the conditions, and did you have access to legal or medical service? Uh, the condition was, I mean, horrible. First of all, you have four. You you uh, they they arrest four brothers, and you every every day you are seeing your brother suffering and you are suffering with them too. It is the hardest thing to see your brother, your brothers are getting harassed, intimidated, or even beaten, and you cannot do anything. My brother Mohammed, he was beaten by, uh, by uh, immigration officer uh, right in front of all, cell, uh, all cellies, uh, all cellmates, and us, and we couldn't do anything. And um, another brother of mine, Mushtaba, he had hard, uh, he had a panic attack, and he was begging and banging the door, please let me, let me out. And they didn't. Uh, finally, they did, and they took him, instead of taking him to, to medical, they took him to another cell, a cold cell down there. My bro other brother, mo mo my, my brother Mohammed again, he was, he was, be uh, he, uh, he had, uh, and uh, he also had panic at attack, because one of his distillery, he was a suicidal guy. He he cut himself, and the the blood was all over. I'm sorry, all over the the cell, and he was banging the door. Please let me out. This guy is killing himself. And finally, uh, and he was shaking. He was really badly shaking, and they didn't do much for him either. The food was bad, uh, especially in Santa Ana jail. It was horrible food. Uh, it was spoiled food. Uh, the, everything was expired, and it was the lowest quality food I had ever seen. And I, sometimes we threw away the food the, 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 in trash. Uh, the, we had uh, none, I would say, medical uh, 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 no, no, no medical access, really, not much. Uh, I, I, I lost my teeth there. I, I, I had depression. We all had depression. We got P PTSD. Uh, the access to lawyers were difficult. The, uh, the, the, uh, the conversation with the lawyers were getting recorded. Uh, and uh, especially in Santa Ana Jail, I know they did that. And uh, sometimes they didn't give, give us our, uh, med our, our documents to be prepared for the court because they, didn't, they wouldn't let, let us to have it on time. So for all these reasons, we didn't feel comfortable at all. It was horrible. I couldn't talk to my parents. There, it was, uh, for some months, we, we, it was so hard to get, 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 get to talk to my parents. And uh, it was very difficult for us to, the whole condition. Thank you, Mohsen. President, I would like to ask you for a few minutes to finish my questions. Just one minute. We only have one question left. Un minuto. Thanks. Uh, the last question, Mohsen. When you were released, were you permitted to remain in the United States? 
What has your life been like since? Uh, I got withholding of removal, so I can stay here. Uh, we had to uh, we had to go to uh, 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 to doctor, psychiatrist, psychologist for over two years myself. Uh, I had no money. My reputation is all gone. I lost a lot of friends, clients, fr and, and even it's hard for me to date because my name is uh, shows on the Google search as a terrorist, and it has to be cleared. So it's very tough for us uh, altogether. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Eh, quisiera eh, hacer una corrección. Identifique al primer declarante como eh, con el con el eh, para para el para la determinación de del otro del otro declarante. Así que Moshe es el que está hoy ahora declarándonos. ¿Verdad? ¿Es así? Es Mosen. Eh, yeah. Mosen, para, yeah. para, tenerlo, para tenerlo presente, porque creo que le dije el nombre del hermano, si no me equivoco. Bien, eh, quiero eh, solicitarle a, al Estado de Estados Unidos si tiene a bien hacer algún interrogatorio al declarante, si así lo prevé. ¿No? Muy bien. Entonces... Vamos a continuar con eh, la participación entonces de los de los del segundo del segundo declarante. Sí. Vamos a llamar Perfect. ahora sí a Mostafa. La pregunta de la comisión, por eso decía, si ¿sí hay, sí. Vamos, va, sí, para que sean las preguntas inmediatamente y después entonces convocamos. Al, al, al siguiente. Eh, vamos a darle la palabra en este en este orden a la, a la segunda vicepresidenta, Roberta Clark, si tiene algunas preguntas para el declarante. Um, thank you very much, um, Vice President Esmeralda. Just a few questions. You, 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 you talked about you were detained for 41 months. Yes. And, um, and, and can you give us the details of detention of your, four, of your three brothers? And were they all held in the same facilities that you were held in? Uh, uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, we all, uh, most of the time, we were, yes, uh, together in the same facility. All of us, we, uh, we stayed in um, solitary confinement in Santa Ana jail for 20 months, uh, 24 hours of uh, lockdown. Only one or two hours they would let us to, to go out, I mean, for uh, free time, one hour, two hours. Sometimes I remember at some time even to 48 hours lockdown. In, in Santa Ana, Santa Ana just, and in Vegas also we were together. It was we all with criminals, by uh, gangbangers and everything else, and I was beaten up by a gangbanger in Santa Ana, uh, in, in Las Vegas County Jail, and uh, about 20 months also in a San Pedro facility. Yes. Um, yes, I just have well, two, short, two short questions. Sure. Um, were you given the reasons for your detention? Um, that's one question. And the other question, what is your profession now? What was your profession then, and what is your profession now? I've been a real estate agent since 1993, so it's my continuous profession since then. The reason for detention was we uh, we participated in, I participated and my brothers also in some rallies against Iranian government, not U.S. government. It was pro-democratic rally for freedom of my country and my, you know, my people. Uh, basically, the, what the government says is that this is the whole core of their arguments in all proceeding is that participation in the rally creates uh, material support and and that's why it caused uh, it it makes you to be a member of that organization and thus you are a terrorist and and uh, they they equal uh, participation in a free democratic rally to terrorism which is uh, I believe this is the against fundamental rights of, uh, of, of everybody. And I came to United States 
when I see that uh, Lady Liberty up there, for me, is it has a big meaning. It means that it means justice, it means freedom, it means law, and it means democracy. So that's why I came here. And I cannot believe that I got detained in U.S. for almost four years, six months the first time, and three and a half years the second time. And my other brother, one of my brothers, he, he got detained one and a half years the first time, and, and three, three and a half years the second time like five years of his life, and we were almost four years, because we just, we just went to a rally against the Iranian government. The violation, immigration violation that they, they brought it up, it was, it was just an excuse. For any immigration violation, I had seen people, a family, let me tell you this, it's a very interesting case, a family of three, husband, wife, and daughter, all of them, they got married, fake marriages, all of them, they got detained in, 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 immigra in the immigration court. In a month, all of them, they got freed. I didn't even see the judge to, to present my case. I didn't falsify any information. My lawyer did falsify the information. They, they signed the, the, the falsified documents, not me. I didn't even have a fair hearing. And after I, our arrest, uh, intimidation of our witness was, was intimidated. intimidated. Uh, the, the government told, told us that you guys have FBI agent, uh, told us that, uh, your honor, I, I want them to be, get detained, to, for them it's safer to, to, to be here, because other people, other, I don't know, some people are wanting to kill them. And I, I, want to, I want them to cooperate with me uh, to be, uh, to, 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 uh, and that was the condition of the release was to, for us to cooperate with him and, and probably become informant. And we did not want to cooperate uh, because the, the groups or the organizations who are pro-democratic against Iranian government, they, we, we share the same values. I cannot, uh, I cannot lose my integrity and conscience. Sí, vamos para tener la oportunidad de la participación de las, los demás comisionados. Le paso la, la, la palabra a la comisionada Mantilla y después al comisionado. Uh, muchas gracias. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, Mr. Mosen. Um, I hear your story with very attention, and I have like a few questions. According to your story, you were expressing yourself, you know, and because of that expression in this march, you were detained. So after you were released, did you ever participate in any other protest or march? This is first. Did you ever express? And the second thing is that it's hard to talk about reparation, I know, but if you could think about any way of reparation that you think that you deserve, what, what would you expect as a reparation? So these two things, please. Thank yes, you. Thank Gracias. you. Sure. Uh, yes, I did. Uh, as I mentioned, it is my absolute right to go to any demonstration, and I'm an advocate of freedom and democracy in my country. I did the last, the most, the last couple of demonstrations I went, it was in Los Angeles. It was for the life, uh, I mean, for, uh, for a, lot of, uh, a lot of Iranians, they came to LA uh, because uh, the, we have a, a, a kind of semi-revolution. They had a semi-revolution last year in Iran, uh, uh, what they call the woman life freedom uh, movement. So I did. Uh, and I will do if there is any more demonstrations of ab absolute I will and if they cannot arrest me They should not arrest me anymore. I mean, it's so ridiculous That uh, they take you for for I mean they take your freedom because you want other people to be free They take your freedom in USA My uh, my request Genuinely we have asked before uh, through our lawyers is uh, the, uh, we uh, I mean our reputation is gone I mean the defamation was big I mean for me even dating is 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 difficult because people they go or, or even getting clients is difficult they, they google your name it's easily and they see you as a terrorist what's going on I want us to to give me an apology a, a written apology 
I heard somebody giving me a verbal apology, but that's not enough. It doesn't solve my problem. I didn't hurt you guys. You hurt me. And second, um, I didn't have a fair hearing. Uh, my, my status is, I don't have a status, good status. It's a withholding of removal. Anytime uh, the government change, they can, I mean, I cannot do much here. I, I, I want a fair hearing. I want an adjustment of status. Also, I need them to offer a remedy for me. I lost four years of my life here combined with my brothers. Over 14, 15, 16 years of life was, is lost. Useful youth life. Gracias, comisionada. Comisionado Caballero. Gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I don't know how clear this. What is your immigration status right now? And if you have been involved in a conflict with the state about this point uh, recently? The two, these two questions. Uh, what was your second question? I'm sorry. The second question is uh, if you have involved in a conflict with the states about your immigration status. Specifically, you mean contact with other states? Uh, no, with the states, with the United States, with the state. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. My my status is withholding of removal. Mm -hmm. It means that they cannot deport me. I'm deportable under the law, under their law, but I cannot uh, stay here for long. I mean, I don't have green card. I I don't have any anything in hand. And also, I got uh, protection under uh, CA uh, CAD uh, Convention Against Torture. It means that if I get to Iran, I get I can get tortured. So I don't really have a solid status. I cannot go out of my country. I lost my parents four or five years ago, and I couldn't I couldn't see them. I I didn't see my parents for 25 years. I wanted to be with my parents when they when they die. I wanted to see them, meet them, you know, kiss them. I hugged them. I couldn't. My, my dad passed away. I wanted, I, honestly, my brothers are here. I seriously wanted my, my, my dad to die in my own hand, not even in hospital, in my lab, or my mom, same. My mom was my friend. I lost my mom four years ago, and she didn't see me. She didn't meet us. My, uh, I mean, my, my, my older brother, he's been here for 40 years. They didn't for 42 years. They didn't see each other. We, we, we cannot go out. We could not go to talk. My mom and dad, several times, they asked us why go talk to a lawyer, do something. I, ca I can't do much, mom. I cannot go out of the country. Can we see you in Turkey? Can we see in Spain, France? No, I can't. Why? And my dad, when we got released, let me tell you this. They asked me, my dad, when I told him that I'm, I'm for three and a half years, they didn't know we are in detention. We didn't tell them. Four brothers, they, you guys, uh, you got, they, they took four brothers together to break him down. They wanted our scope to cooperate for what? To, to cooperate to, against other, other freedom seekers that they have, we share the same values. So I, I don't have any studies. Um, I lost my parents without seeing them. I just sometimes, some my friends, they send me picture of their graves, that's it. And the uh, U.S. has not helped us so far. I mean, we are under probation, sir. We have been under probation for 15, 17, 18 years. We had to call them weekly after we got out, even though we are not criminal. We had to call them weekly to, to say that we are here for probation. The officers, they used to come to our home once a month. And then it becomes six months. Even now, up to now, uh, once a year we have to go and report that we are here. We are not escaping. Where can I go? I need a status. I don't have any status. I lost a lot of money. I lost all my reputation, four years of life. And I, I hope it doesn't happen to other people. I hope so. And uh, the material support, that the, this word that they could use, in their immigration status, immigration arguments, material support, attending a rally is a material support for this uh, organization. This organization had over 200 congressmen and senators. They, they, they supported them. Jo Mr. John Ashcroft, he was supporting the organization. We were arrested at the time 
we were arrested at a time that Mr. John Ashcroft, he was head of Justice Department, and he was o supporting okay. that organization. Yes. We, thank you very much. I appreciate the answer. You, we have to finish. Thank you very much. Gracias. Disculpen, disculpen. Bueno, muchas gracias. Yo no voy a hacer preguntas por asuntos de tiempo, agradeciéndole al declarante su participación. Eh, paso ahora, a, ahora sí, a llamar al segundo declarante, ahora sí, el señor Moshe, no, no, es el, sí, sí, Mostafa. es que como in, invertí el orden, Mostafa, ahora sí, yeah. Mostafa, Seyed, muchas gracias. Y ahora sí, muy bien, disculpe, sí. Vamos entonces a escuchar al, el testimonio de la presunta víctima, Mostafa Seyed, quien declarará sobre su experiencia en la detención, las presuntas violaciones a la libertad de expresión, el debido proceso, el impacto de esto en su vida, en su vida como consecuencia de las presuntas violaciones de los derechos humanos y las reparaciones que considera necesarias. La parte Peticionaria tendrá los 10 minutos para realizar el, interro el interrogatorio. Si sí les vamos a pedir que eh, el declarante tenga la precisión de, del tiempo, y de manera que eh, podamos entonces la comisión, el Estado y la comisión hacer el interrogatorio que corresponde. Thank you very much. Uh, most of it. Did you participate in any freedom of expression or speech once here in the United States? Yes, I have. I have been in se several ra rallies, pro-democracy de ra rallies uh, sponsored by NCRI in this country, including the one in Denver in 1997. Thank you. What happened when you were detained in 2001? In, in 2001, um, We, uh, I received a phone call from my attorney uh, that you should uh, give in to FBI and FBI is looking for you. you they want to detain you again. And uh, I gave my address and everything and they came there uh, with all guns and everything on my head as usual. It's no normal for them, I guess. And they uh, arrested me and detained me, and they took me to downtown for processing. And uh, at that time, they put me in a uh, in a room that was, was about 20 by f 20 feet by 15 feet. There were uh, there were about 150 people there, and there were two toilets there. One was always clocked and it smells all over this. And we were begging the guard to open the door and uh, le let us have some um, air. They would, not, they would not even do that. So, so they used to keep us there for all day. And at night time, uh, they um, take us uh, to San Pedro jail And San Pedro jail, there were no bed at the time. They didn't ha have a bed, so they had some plastic temporary beds. Uh, they put those in, in restrooms, in, in the toilets. And they asked us to go and, and sleep there. And we used to sleep there. And, and uh, at the, the next day, they used to do the same thing, going to da downtown again and being in that same room again. So this was going on for some time. And after that, um, we actually went to uh, uh, transfer to Santa Ana jail. It, it's a different jail. And we were there for some time, for a long time. And in that particular jail, each cell, each cell the, the, there were two beds on each cell. And uh, we were locked on most of the time. I mean, uh, 24 hours and uh, some, sometimes for three, four days even, we were locked down. And uh, we were begging to be out for an hour or two, and sometimes they would let, let us out for an hour or two. 
but beside that, uh, it was a really he hellish life for us. Uh, it was so stressful, and s we went through so much stress and everything. Um, basically, uh, that was that jail, and, and, and at some point, they took us to uh, La Las Vegas jail as well, and uh, in La Las Vegas jails, uh, it was really bad. All gang members, uh, killers, and bank ro robbers, and all the, all those people were there. And so we were basically mixed with ca ca criminals all the time. Uh, all, all, all in all these three jails, they all were ra rapists, criminals, bad people. Uh, I, I do recall in San Pedro jail, I asked uh, that I didn't want to uh, sleep next to a gang member. Uh, they said, no, you cannot do that. You have to sleep right here. Uh, and then I said, I don't feel comfortable. These are gang members. These are killers. I, I just don't feel safe. And uh, they told me that um, uh, you have to do, I, I, I said, is there any way that I can go to se segregation? They said, no, you have to do something bad in order to go there. I said, what should I do? I said, well, you have to go and beat somebody. In, so in order to go to, uh, basically to uh, se segregation, I thought it's safer, personally, for my life. They said, no, you cannot do that. You have to be this and that. And uh, the situation was very, was very bad. I, 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 I personally am ve vegetarian, and uh, I lost at least 20-some pounds uh, while, while I was in jail. And they, they, they were not gi giving the right food to us. Uh, uh, and, and also, one side of, uh, of our story was my mom and dad back, back home in my country. We used to call uh, them uh, once every two weeks, and uh, when we went when we when we when we were detained, um, they didn't gi 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 give us the chance to call them for at least uh, two months or so, and my mom was uh, thought that this something has ha 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 happened to us, and basically uh, she went to ho hospital and she was in a really bad shape. So we, so we were de dealing with uh, our folks back home, uh, our life here in jail, and, and meanwhile we, we used to pay our bills and all these things on time. We were trying to pay, pay all these things as well. Thank you. When you were released, were you permitted to remain in the United States? Uh, I had a temporary status. We we all had a temporary status on, on, under Convention Against Torture, CAT. Uh, yes, we could stay uh, uh, as long as go government of Iran was back home, was was in existence. Yes, we 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 could stay here. Yes. Did you have a fair hearing in the immigration proceeding regarding the revocation of the bond and the grant of asylum? Yes, our bond revocation, it did have happen uh, when we had a bond hearing. Uh, we didn't have a fair hearing. Uh, uh, all four, four of us were bundled in one he hearing. And uh, so it was not an individual he hearing for our bond. So, and FBI a a agent Castillo, uh, he produced uh, a document uh, and our name was there and he called this uh, uh, LSL form. And he said that this shows that you guys are member of a terrorist organization, basically. And, um, uh, and he asked the judge uh, to uh, not, not to give us bond and keep us in jail uh, as long as possible because he, 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 he was asking us to cooperate with him uh, on a case that he had against uh, some uh, p 
people that were against go government of um, my country, basically, and uh, um, yeah, and uh, and and he and he also said that uh, attending a, ra a rally creates material support for that group. Uh, 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 attending a ra rally create material support for 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 that group thank you what has your life been like since um when when we got out, out of jail uh, it was hell really we our, our life was completely upside down uh, we, we we were drained psychologically destroyed we used to go at least for two for two three years to different psychologists and doctors, and uh, and also we lost. I mean, we uh, everything was expired. My, my real estate license was expired. My DMV uh, IDs were expired, and we had to go through all these things and re renew everything. And uh, when I use when I got got in touch got, got in touch with my clients, they all were, was very afraid. They, they all were very afraid to talk to me. They said that you are a terrorist. They say we don't feel comfortable. So they really destroyed our life. Uh, our life was completely destroyed by U U.S. Go 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 government for three and a half years. A stressful life. A stressful day night thinking uh, what's going on what should we do with my mom and my mom my, my dad what the heck to do this here because we didn't let my pa parents know that we were in jail all, all along we finished thank you <laughs> muchísimas gracias gracias al declarante thank you eh, quisiera hacer el, el, el declarar en, en, en este momento que existe el principio del Estado para de reservar eh, su posibilidad, en su voluntad de interrogar al testigo, como se dio en, en el primer testigo, quisiera eh, tener la posición de, del Estado en, esta, en este tema. No, thank you. Again, we decline to ask any questions at Muy this bien. time. Thank you. Bueno, no. Muchísimas gracias. Muy bien. Eh, Comienza Roberta, sí, no, sí, voy a, bueno, este, Thank lo, le vamos a dar la palabra ahora a la comisión y comenzamos con yes. la eh, comisionada Roberta. Just one, just one short question. You said, sir, as you began your your, your um, testimony, you said that you were detained again in 2001. Uh, were you detained before that? Yes, we all were de de detained the first time in 19 in March of 1999, and I do recall that um, uh, a special agent uh, and and the FBI agent they both told us that they would send us to e Iran as a present for me President Khatami back home in my country. So they were trying to send us back home as a present, present to Khatami. So this clearly shows that our case was po politically motivated since the, si since the inception of it. So, uh, and the, you, they also to told us that you are, they used word F, you are, you are fucking Mujahid. And you will be sent to to Iran as a present to, to President Khatami because it was a Persian. It it actually was per, March is a Persian New, New Year, so they, they were trying to send us as a present to Khatami for the New, New, New Year, basically. Uh, and and we actually were in detention in jail for six months. The same si situation that I explained before that uh, we they used to take us to this 
bunkers. They call it bun bu bunker. It is a room around 20 feet by 15 feet. And, the, and, we, and we were there, 150 people, sometimes 200 people were there. And no air, a smell everywhere. I mean, so they used to keep us uh, there for weeks. And at night time, uh, they take us, uh, they, they used to take us to San Pedro jail. Again, the same problem, bathrooms. They, uh, 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 they pu pu put us in the bathroom they, they, with this bed that they had. And then the next day, we, they, they used to, to take us again. And then, uh, and then at, at one point, they, they, uh, they kept us in San, San Pedro jail. Uh, and, uh, and I'm sorry, uh, we actually, the first time we were in La La Lancaster jail. We were in Lancaster jail for, for a long time. So we, so we were detained for six months ourselves. To three of us, Mo Mohammed was in jail for a, a, a year and a half. So, uh, and we had the same stressful life. And my parents, again, was the issue here. How should we get in touch with them? And so on. Gracias. Comisionada Mantilla. Muchas gracias, Presidenta. Um, thank you, Mr. Mustafa. Thank you very much for your testimony. Okay. Two short questions, please, to be very precise in the answer. First of all, you mentioned that you have this psychological impact, depression. And besides that, you have other impact in your physical health, that your body, your behavior change, and these things. And the other thing is that um, if you have the opportunity, I know that it's very difficult to talk about reparation after all what you suffer. So, but if you could ask for a reparation, what would you ask now? Thank you. Uh, uh, in regards to, I mean, I have some a, a stuttering as as you can hear me, and this did ha happen in no, 1999. The first uh, uh, arrest that we that I had and we all had, and the way they attacked our home, the way they acted toward us, banging our doors from back and forth uh, in, uh, in the from through the back side and front side, dang, 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 dang. Open, 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 it was about 5, 6 a.m. And I woke up and I, and I was fainted, and I was just about fainting. And they, and they came inside with gun at our head, you are ter terrorists, this and that, and the, where is your guns and explosives? I said, we have no guns and explosives here. So, and then they search everywhere for guns and explosives and things like that. So from the beginning, from that point, uh, I started studying. And uh, my life really got upside down from that time. And, uh, you know, life in jail, uh, you know, three and a half years of precious life the second time, and six months of uh, my precious life and our and our. Precious life the first time, uh, there has to be a re remedy for that. It's not fair to us. And we went to different courts in this country. We went to Ninth Circuit, to different courts here. They, they informed us that they could not hear our case because we are not a U.S. C citizen. And beside that, they, they informed us that go government has I immunity in this country, and they can do anything they want, basically. So in, in a way, they told us that go government is absolute here. There is nobody can do anything about it. The, they are absolute. They are the king. The king, uh, not like you, uh, they're, they're absolute. So basically, um, and for that, we would like to have a, re, a, a, a just re, 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 re remedy for what we have gone through uh, in, in, uh, in our life and so on. And as I don't know if uh, Mo, 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 Mohsen explained to you or not, we, we had a key witness in our in, 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 in immigration case that, who, that was uh, written when he came to court, 
he he was threatened not to be a witness so he left if he were to become a witness he he was told that that he he would be charged and, and put in jail again so our, our, our key witness for our asylum uh, he he left the court so and so on thank you gracias el comisionado caballero no va a hacer preguntas bien voy a hacer una, unas preguntas, eh, dos, dos puntos muy, muy concretos. Eh, cuando usted llega a Estados Unidos saliendo de su país por razones de, de protección, de seguridad, la respuesta de eh, Estados Unidos, ¿cuál fue? De acuerdo a su, a su percepción, eh, los años que tenía, eh, ¿Cómo, cómo evaluó, evaluó usted eh, esa respuesta que Estados Unidos le daba para entrar al, al país? ¿Cómo? No sé si, si comprende la pregunta en la traducción. Al, al... Yes. Ajá. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, actually, I came in this con con to, to this con country in... Uh, January of 1978. It was be, 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 yeah, before a re, 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 re revolution, and, and I came here a, as a student, and, and I did have a vi visa here. And uh, while I was in this country, uh, I, I did attend ra rallies against the mo mullahs that are in po power right now. So I turn against them basically. Uh, so, but, but, but of course, in this this country, I I I was very ha happy to be here because I thought here we have the the it, it is a center of the the, the the democracy and so on. So, um, yeah, that's basically. Y, eh, eh, y en esa, en esa línea de esa consideración, el centro de, de, del derecho, de la libertad, eh, ¿cuándo cambia esa situación en, en su vida y, y, y las razones que, que, que tenía de acuerdo a, su, a su, lo, que, lo que usted sabía, lo que usted conocía de la posición de, ahora del Estado, del, del gobierno de Estados Unidos, para, para cambiar de, de posición en el trato y todas las situaciones que usted ha planteado como, como infierno. Esa fue la palabra que, que usted usó. Eh, ¿qué, qué, 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 ¿Qué representó para usted ese cambio? ¿Qué explicación podía usted encontrar o qué... Eh, argumentación usted preparó para, en su mente para no entender, porque no, no había por qué entender, sino estar viviendo lo que vivía, el cambio que se, que se dio. ¿Cuál cree usted que fue el motivo y toda la, la situación que transforma esa, ese pensamiento del Estado como el derecho hecho verdad en todo su sentido? ¿Comprendió mi, yeah. mi pregunta? Yes. Thank you. Um, um, yes, I mean, from the beginning, uh, that's what I explained, that I was under the impression that this country is for the de democracy and yeah, everything, yeah. and we have these rights. El cambio. R rights rights to, to attend that rallies and and read different books and different o o opinions so and so but what happened in our case was the one that changed my mind about it what really ha happened in our case it was i i just couldn't believe it that this is going on in this country and i'm sis and 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 i'm si sitting in jail and and they're asking me to cooperate and they're asking me uh, attending a, ra a rally creates ma ma material support. 
and so on. So actually, it ha happened. The change ha happened. What, what what happened to us basically changed my mind about this this whole issue. Bueno, eh, muchas gracias. Thank Yo quisiera so ahora eh, agradecemos su declaración y vamos a continuar entonces I escuchando el alegato de las partes. La parte peticionaria tendrá 15 minutos para presentarlos y luego el Estado si sí, así lo considera. Le doy la palabra. Honorable commissioners, members of the Secretariat, thank you for convening this hearing. Thank you as well for providing a space where Mohsen, Mojtaba, Mostafa, and Mohammed can finally be heard after years of being denied a hearing in the United States. The Mirmedi brothers are here today because of the enduring effects of the pervasive discrimination against non-citizen Muslim men of Middle Eastern, African, and South Asian descent post 9-11, and the systematic closing of courthouse doors to immigrants seeking to vindicate their rights through the judicial system. I will discuss how the brothers had their bond revoked after 9-11 based upon their political expression and ethnic origin then we will discuss how they were denied proper due process based on their immigration status. And then we will discuss the reparations the brothers seek. After 9-11, the United States government embarked on a massive investigative campaign. As a result of this campaign, the FBI arrested 738 non-citizens between September 11th, 2001 and August 6th, 2002, 97% of whom were Middle Eastern, South Asian, or of African descent. Nearly all of these detainees were found to have no connection to terror groups. The Mirmedis, who are in front of you today, were caught in this unjustified sweep. The Mirmedis came to America because of persecution for their political expression in Iran. In the United States, the Mirmedis became real estate agents in the greater Los Angeles area and continued expressing support for a democratic Iran. They saw America as it is so often portrayed in the media, a beacon for the open expression of ideas, and understandably believed that they finally lived in a country where this expression would be protected. They attended several pro-democracy rallies during the mid-1990s, including a June 20th, 1997 demonstration in Denver, organized by the National Council of Resistance of Iran, the NCRI. While only two of the brothers were able to attend the rally, all four originally planned on attending. After 9-11, the Mirmedis were caught in a dragnet that primarily targeted Middle Eastern, South Asian, and African men. The government detained the brothers and sought to revoke their bond. The main piece of evidence used against them was a travel log for the 1997 Denver rally. The FBI took the log out of context and it became the crucial piece of evidence used to revoke the brothers' bond and arbitrarily detain them for three and a half years. The FBI argued this was not a travel log, but a cell form that demonstrated the Mirmedis were supporters of the MEK, an Iranian opposition group listed by the United States as a terror organization in 1997 and delisted in 2012. Dr. Mehran Kamrava, an expert in Farsi and regional politics, submitted an affidavit today for the hearing confirming that the FBI mistranslated the form and it is simply a travel log. The date of the NCRI event even appears on the top of the form. In reality, the brothers were never members of the MEK and simply cared about promoting democracy and human rights in their country of origin. The US detained the Mirmedis for 41 months using evidence that only existed because of their political expression. The list of names, given that it is incontrovertibly related to attendance at a pro-democracy demonstration, implicates the brothers' rights to freedom of expression, assembly, and association. The US violated the Mirmedi's Article 4 right to freedom of expression by revoking their bond based on evidence related to their political speech. The commission's jurisprudence prohibits discrimination and detention based on freedom of expression. In Bisset versus Cuba, for example, the commission found a violation of the petitioner's Article 4 rights 
when they were arrested for protected political speech. The United States actions in this case are even more egregious than Bissett because the speech here was not even directed at the United States. And it was endorsed by members of Congress at the time, many of whom attended the rally in Denver in 1997. The commission has also emphasized that the rights to freely assemble and associate are closely related to freedom of expression. In Huilca, Texas versus Peru, the court found that the right to assemble and associate included the pursuit of a legitimate goal without pressure or interference from public authorities. The United States violated the Mermetti's rights to assembly and association by detaining the brothers for participating in a peaceful assembly with fellow supporters of a legitimate political cause, democracy in Iran. Four brothers escaped political persecution in their home country and learned that their human rights were still every bit as illusory in the United States. I'll now turn it over to my colleague, Kat Washington, to discuss the deprivations of due process that the Mermetis suffered. Thank you. As my colleague stated, the Mermetti brothers have endured significant due process violations, largely stemming from discriminatory post 9-11 policies, the use of false evidence and testimony in their bond revocation hearing, and the denial of any effective judicial remedy. The American Declaration and Inter-American Case Law both prohibit discrimination and guarantee rights for all, even for non-citizens, and especially for protected political activity. In both Frere, Mazora, and Biscuit, the Commission found that a state cannot make distinctions in treatment that are disproportionate to state goals, or that are discriminatory. Both independent NGOs and the U.S. government have found that the United States post 9-11 immigration, national security, and anti-terrorism policies were based on discriminatory religious and racial profiling. The U.S. consistently denied the Mermetti's rights under the same discriminatory framework. The timing of their arrest indicates that the U.S. used the L.A. cell form as a pretext for arresting them. In actuality, they were arrested due to their Iranian nationality as part of a systematic profiling of Middle Eastern immigrants after 9-11, culminating in a denial of the brothers' rights under Articles 2 and 17. The brothers also endured violations of their right to an impartial hearing. In Mortlock v. U.S., the Commission recognized that an individual shall not be denied due process protections in immigration proceedings. In addition, in Oliveros Munoz v. Venezuela, the Commission established that a state's duty to fully and impartially investigate its human rights abuses is obligatory. It cannot be just a mere formality preordained to be ineffective. The U.S. utilized blatantly false and misconstrued evidence to justify the revocation of the Brothers' Bond, including the distortion and falsification of several aspects of the L.A. cell form. Moreover, the decision to revoke the Brothers' Bond was also tainted by witness intimidation. In Telugu's v. U.S., this commission found that the use of witness statements known to be false amounts to a denial of justice, contrary to due process standards. Baram Tabatabai, a witness that corroborated, corroborated the FBI's version of events, recanted his testimony on two separate occasions. Tabatabai was also prepared to testify in favor of the brothers during Muhammad's bond hearing, but Agent Castillo threatened him prior to this hearing. Castillo's threats persuaded Tabatabai not to testify. By basing their case against the petitioners on falsified evidence and recanted testimony, the United States violated the Mermetti's right to due process and a fair trial. After release from detention, the brothers filed a civil rights lawsuit in the U.S. District Court, alleging false imprisonment, unlawful detention, witness intimidation, and conspiracy to violate civil rights. However, the District Court dismissed all of their claims. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals affirmed this dismissal on the grounds that non-citizens do not have an ability commensurate with that of citizens to seek justice for violations of their rights through the United States judicial system. The Court of Appeals also found that the brothers had an effective remedy in their immigration proceedings, despite the fact that it is not possible to bring a wrongful detention claim in U.S. immigration court. 
In Amesian v. U.S., this commission held that the denial of a remedy is an independent violation of due process rights, and that where a petitioner was unable to access any effective civil remedy for 16 years, every indication of domestic law is that such remedy is not meant to exist. The commission also found that there is an inalienable right to know the truth about past events so as to prevent recurrence. Likewise, here, for over 20 years, the United States has systematically deprived the Mermedis of any effective judicial remedy for their wrongful arrest and detention. More fundamentally, the Mermedis have had no chance to expose the truth, motives, and circumstances behind their unfounded detention. We thank you today for providing Mustafa, Mohammed, Mohsen, and Mostaba the chance to have their voices heard, an opportunity that they were denied in U.S. court. I will now turn the discussion to my colleague, Tessa Baser, to discuss the long-term consequences of the brothers' detention, along with what they hope to achieve by bringing this case. Thank you. The petitioners have suffered consequences to their health, professional lives, and personal lives because of their arbitrary arrest and detention. Over 20 years after their initial arrest, the Mermetis have yet to receive reparations or compensation for their wrongful detention and the lack of due process that they endured. The Mermetis continue to suffer long-term mental health effects stemming from their detention, such as frequent nightmares. Mustafa has constant recurrent traumatic memories. Mohammed has recurrent anxiety when he sees things that remind him of his wrongful detention, such as white vans and plastic silverware. He remains in constant fear of the FBI's watchful eye. He also re-experiences trauma whenever he has to interact with immigration officials, which is a necessary and regular occurrence due to his lack of permanent status. Mohsen also experiences recurrent fear and anxiety when seeing unfamiliar cars and people, and remains constantly nervous that he is being watched by government officials. Much top experiences sudden flashbacks, anxiety, and depression. The brothers have adequately and aptly testified today as to the reputational harms they've suffered. They were unable to work for three and a half years. After they were released, their client lists were decimated. As they've testified, the United States false accusations continue to affect them to this day. These false accusations against them damaged their reputation in both Los Angeles and Iran because they were widely publicized in both national and international media. In a Messier, in this commission held that a remedy for a human rights violation must be sufficient to obtain reparation for the harms caused. In Maldonado Rodriguez, the commission held that states are required to provide integral reparations for human rights violations. We urge the commission to recommend that the Mermedis receive compensation, comprehensive reparations, and remediation for the violations they suffered as a result of state action. These reparations must include monetary compensation for the pain and suffering the Mermetis endured while detained and the hardship the brothers incurred due to their combined loss of income, clients, and property. In Amazian, the commission recommended that the petitioner who was detained without charge due to alleged ties to terrorism be compensated both for his wrongful detention and for the lasting psychological harm that the actions of state officials caused. In Suresh v. Canada, the commission recommended that the state provide reparations to the petitioner who was wrongfully detained and denied permanent status because of the government's false belief of his involvement with foreign terrorism. In Amazian, the commission also recommended that the state provide a public statement by a high-ranking official making clear that the petitioner is not and never was a terrorist. Here, reparations must include formal recognition of the state's wrongdoing through an official apology by high-level officials and the state officials who were involved in perpetrating these harms. The reparation should also include an adjustment of the Mermetis' immigration status to that of asylum. Due to the lack of due process they faced in the immigration proceedings, the brothers need to have the rights and stability coterminous with that of a more permanent immigration status. Reparations must also include the adoption of measures aimed at clarifying the facts of their arrest and detention. They have not yet had the chance to expose the motives and circumstances behind the state abuse. In Los Aventura v. U.S., the Commission urged the United States to review fall trials and sentences according to the fair trial and due process guarantees in the American Declaration. 
They should do the same here. This could include an investigation aimed at evaluating the facts of the petitioner's arbitrary arrest and detention according to inter-American standards. Finally, the United States must formally review its laws, policies, and practices to ensure that additional persons are not deprived of fundamental rights based on their immigration status or national origin. The U.S. should train its officials, including those in the judiciary, according to international standards. In Ferrer Mazorra, the Commission urged the United States to ensure all rights in the American Declaration be fully afforded to detained non-citizens. Distressingly, the Commission made this recommendation in 2000, before the Mermetti's wrongful detention even occurred. To this day, the United States continues to violate the rights of non-citizens held in, det in detention. The United States must take measures now to ensure the non-repetition of these violations. Muchísimas gracias. Vamos inmediatamente. Le preguntamos al Estado si va a hacer eh, uso del de tiempo para eh, hacer sus alegatos. Sí. ¿Sí? Gracias. Buenos Muy días. bien. Good morning. Thank you first to the distinguished commissioners, secretariat colleagues, to the Mermedi family for being here today, to the two brothers who shared your experiences. My name is Thomas Hastings. I'm honored to be here in my capacity as the deputy permanent representative of the U.S. mission to the Organization of American States. I'd first like to reiterate my government's support for the commission's important work of monitoring human rights situations and shedding light on these issues both here in the United States and throughout the Western Hemisphere. We also acknowledge that petitioners before the Commission play an important role in advocating for the promotion and protection of human rights by all OAS member states. And to that end, we'd like to thank the petitioners who are participating today for sharing your testimony. As an initial matter, the United States maintains its position that this case is inadmissible before this body. However, we are here to listen to the petitioners on this matter and receive any observations which are raised in today's hearing by the Commission. I'm pleased to be joined here today by colleagues from the U.S. Department of State and the U.S. Department of Homeland Security who will provide further U.S. statements on this matter. And I'd like to first turn to my colleague Sarah Hunter from the Department of State's Office of Legal Advisor to begin. Thank you. For context, I'll begin with a brief history. The petitioners arrived in the United States between the years of 1978 and 1993. For years, they lived and worked here without legal immigration status. Eventually, they all applied for asylum in 1998 with the assistance of an individual who was later uh, convicted of filing false claims. Petitioners admitted that they filed fraudulent applications and obtained fraudulent identification. This included falsifying dates of entry to satisfy the general requirement that you apply for asylum within one year of arriving to the United States. In 1999, they were arrested for immigration violations but released on bond that same year. Their immigration case progressed, but in early 2001, the federal government searched an MEK safe house and uncovered a document containing the names of petitioners, the LA cell form. An FBI translator described this document as a list of affiliates of the MEK, then designated as a foreign terrorist organization by the US Department of State. In light of this development, as well as testimony by an FBI agent who was in touch with a confidential informant and other information, the government revoked bond for the petitioners in October 2001. An immigration judge upheld the bond revocation. That decision was explicitly not based on the LA cell form alone. Petitioners filed habeas petitions regarding their detention, which were held by the Board of Immigration Appeals and the US District Court. In 2002, they were granted withholding of removal, but denied asylum given the untimely filing date. Moshan and Muhammad appealed to the Court of Appeal which remanded on the bond determination, but upheld the asylum denial. Ultimately, all of the petitioners were released from detention before the district court rendered a decision. Petitioners also filed a civil tort claim. That claim was in part settled, and the remainder of that claim was dismissed. That dismissal was affirmed. What I hope to illustrate with this review is the due process the petitioners received. Their assertions were carefully considered in several forums. 
The United States re reiterates that petitioners settled their civil case and received monetary compensation. That settlement precludes review here. Although petitioners may not be satisfied with the result, they have received effective remedies. They were given the chance to appeal various decisions, were ultimately granted withholding of removal, received monetary compensation, and released from detention. As both the Commission and the Inter-American Court have stated on numerous occasions, these international human rights bodies are set up to work as complements to domestic courts and processes. The Commission has explained that under the fourth instance formula, that it lacks jurisdictions to substitute its judgment for that of the national courts on matters that involve the interpretation and explanation of domestic law or the evaluation of the facts. To this end, the Commission's role is not to sit in review of domestic forums. The petitioners have had ample opportunity to make these claims and did so. As we stated in our briefs, petitioners have also failed to exhaust all available domestic remedies regarding their bond determinations and asylum claims. Accordingly, the United States urges the Commission to reconsider its admissibility decision, allowable under the plain reading of Article 34, which notes that not only petitions but cases may be found inadmissible. Petitioners are also unable to establish any violation of the American Declaration. The American Declaration recognizes an, ability, an individual's ability to access judicial remedies, but it does not preordain the outcome of those remedies. That petitioners did not prevail in their challenge before U.S. administrative bodies and courts does not and cannot mean that they were denied access to judicial remedies under the meaning of Articles 18 and 26. Despite their contrary claims, they were not arbitrarily detained. They were detained because they violated immigration laws and there was evidence connecting them to a group on the foreign terrorist organization list. Their nationality and political activity were not factors in their detention their potential relationship with a terrorist organization was. The, the petitioners re-raise arguments they made domestically about the allegedly falsified evidence that led to their bond being revoked. Multiple administrative bodies and courts heard this evidence. Um, and their brief is replete with claims that the government agents involved in the case knowingly presented false information. But they have presented no facts to substantiate that claim then or now. Moreover, Article 33 of the Declaration recognizes that the duty of every person to obey the law and other legitimate commands of the authorities of his country and those of the country in which he may be. Non-nationals are bound to respect the state's immigration laws and may be subject to various measures, including detention, as appropriate when they fail to obey the law. Immigration detention, provided it is employed in a manner consistent with the state's international human rights obligation, is permitted under international law. Overall, petitioners have failed to establish facts to support any violation of the American Declaration. Finally, the United States has consistently maintained that the Commission's recommendations are not binding on the United States. The expansive relief that petitioners request goes far beyond the Commission's remedial capabilities. Let me now turn to our colleagues from the U.S. Department of Homeland Security for their statements. Uh, distinguished commissioners, petitioners, Representatives, Secretariat staff, and colleagues, on behalf of the Department of Homeland Security, or DHS, I welcome the opportunity to participate in today's hearing. My name is Scott Schuchart. I'm counselor to the director at U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, which is um, a component within DHS. First, I want to share with the Commission that the DHS Office of Inspector General, OIG, and the DHS Office for Civil Rights and Civil Liberties, CRCL, as well as the ICE Office of Professional Responsibility, OPR, all reviewed allegations that Mohammed Mirmedi was mistreated by an ICE detention officer in ICE custody on March 5, uh, 2005. And as was shared uh, uh, with him in a letter from CRCL dated March 27, 2008, the OIG's independent investigation, which included interviewing multiple witnesses, did not substantiate those allegations. Following the incident, ICE also notified both the Civil Rights Section of the United States Attorney's Office in Los Angeles and the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Department of Justice about the incident, and both declined to prosecute. Second, I want to discuss ICE detention and bond proceedings. Prior to obtaining a final order of removal, ICE detains individuals where ICE is prohibited by law from releasing them or where the facts of the case reflect that the individual poses a danger to persons or property 
uh, or where it's determined that no amount of bond or conditions would be sufficient to ensure the individual's appearance at future immigration proceedings or for removal. As happened in the petitioner's case, non-citizens may challenge a determination of whether they are bond eligible and an adverse bond decision by an immigration judge may be appealed to the Board of Immigration Appeals. The federal district courts also have jurisdiction to consider challenges to prolonged civil immigration detention in the context of a petition for writ of habeas corpus. Finally, I want to highlight ICE's current detention standards, which are designed to ensure that non-citizens in ICE's custody are treated humanely and with respect, protected from harm, provided access to necessary medical and mental health care, and able to access materials and individuals who may represent them or assist them with their immigration cases. ICE has updated and revised its detention standards uh, since the petitioner's period of detention. For example, ICE's performance-based national detention standards, first issued in 2008, were most recently revised in 2016, and the separate national detention standards, which apply to certain facilities, were first issued in 2000 and revised most recently in 2019. ICE's detention standards now establish minimum conditions of detention for detained non-citizens with respect to environmental health and safety, detainee non-citizen care, access to legal resources and consular officials, recreation activities, grievance processes to address complaints and concerns about conditions of confinement, and a number of other issues. These standards are designed to ensure humane conditions tailored to the needs of the ICE detained non-citizen population consistent with the civil rather than penal purpose of immigration detention. And now I will turn it over to my colleague Monica Burke to talk about detention oversight. Distinguished commissioners, petitioners, secretariat staff, and colleagues, it is an honor to appear before you today on behalf of ICE Enforcement and Removal Operations, or ERO. My name is Monica Burke, and I am the Assistant Director of the Custody Management Division within ICE ERO. I will provide information about ICE detention oversight, particularly updates that have occurred since the petitioners were detained in the early 2000s. This includes major changes since 2005 within ICR ERO Custody Management Division and the ICE Office of Professional Responsibility, as well as the creation of the ERO Contact Center of Operations and the office, DHS Office of the Immigration Detention Ombudsman. DHS, DHS meets its constitutional and statutory mandates, which are consistent with international human rights standards <clears throat> by confine, confining non-citizens in detention facilities that are safe, humane, and appropriately secure and by implementing or mandating training requirements for all of its law enforcement personnel and detention staff. DHS is also responsible for monitoring performance and investigating alleged misconduct wherever warranted. Um, notably, I would also like to mention that most of our facilities uh, that house the majority of our population are dedicated facilities where we house non-citizens separate and apart from other populations. Um, we do use other types of facilities, but that is uh, the vast majority of our population is um, detained in dedicated facilities, and they are separate from, again, other uh, populations. Um, I'd also like to note that we do allow protective custody, um, so we have uh, individuals can be in special housing for protective custody reasons, uh, not just for a disciplinary segregation. The ICRO Custody Management Division provides policy and oversight for the administrative custody of ICE's highly transient and diverse population. ICRO employs more than 32 on-site federal detention service managers at key ICE detention facilities to monitor and inspect operations daily to ensure safe, secure, and humane conditions of confinement. The ICE Office of Professional Responsibility Inspections Division is responsible for the objective review of ICE offices and programs by assessing their compliance with federal law applicable policies and procedures, and the agency's own detention standards. ICE OPR's Office of Detention Oversight conducts annual inspections of ICE facilities depending on how many non-citizens are detained there and for how long. These inspections assess facility compliance with ICE detention standards. The ERL Contact Center of Operations supports the ICE Detention Reporting and Information Line, or DRILL, a toll-free service that provides a direct channel for detained individuals, agency stakeholders, and the public to communicate with ICE to answer detention-related questions and resolve concerns. 
Concerns related to employee and contractor uh, conduct may be submitted to ICE OPR, where they are reviewed by ICE OPR and the DHS Office of Inspector General. In 2019, Congress created the DHS Office of the Immigration Detention Ombudsman, or OIDO, which is the new office that oversees immigration detention. OIDO assists individuals with complaints about potential violations of immigration detention standards or misconduct by DHS or contract personnel, and includes conducting announced and unannounced inspection and serves as an independent office to review and resolve problems. Additional layers of oversight are undertaken through site visits, investigations and audits from the ICE Health Service Corps, the U.S. Government Accountability Office, CRCL, and the U.S. Department of Labor, among others. These multiple channels of oversight enable ICE to provide and maintain a high standard of care for the detained population. As relevant to this case specifically, ICE no longer uses the facilities where the petitioners were housed. Specifically, those facilities are the San Pedro Service Processing Center, the Santa Ana County Jail, the Mira Loma Correction Center, and the Las Vegas City Jail. Finally, we understand from their petition that petitioners may be interested in conducting their yearly check-ins with ICE at a location other than the Los Angeles field office. ICE is amenable to having them report to a different location. We can follow up with petitioners and their advocates after this hearing, or their petitioners and advocates can reach out using the email address losangeles.outreach at ice.dhs.gov, or go online to www.ice.gov slash check-in for more information about rescheduling a time and place for ICE check-ins. Thank you very much. ¿Concluyeron? Sí, muy bien. Muchas gracias. Eh, le pregunto a los peticionarios si van a hacer eh, uso del derecho a dúplica por cinco minutos. Thank you. To begin, I'd like to note that the brothers' claims were related to the wrongful imprisonment were already declared admissible by the commission, so any arguments relating to admissibility are moot in this proceeding. Next, I'd like to turn to the allegations regarding más, their... Más despacio para okay. la, sí, por favor. <laughs> the allegations regarding their immigration sí. litigation. The statute of limitations requiring immigrants to bring an asylum claim within one year was not in place until 1996. As we've noted, all the brothers entered the United States prior to that period. Therefore, when they entered the United States, this requirement was not in place. The brothers have testified today about their desire and their attempts to bring witnesses on their behalf to their bond proceedings. Uh, this witness was intimidated by FBI agent Christopher Castillo and threatened with arrest and detention if he testified on the brothers' behalf. Likewise, the brothers attempted to bring evidence of their innocence in their civil proceedings, but these, the, um, the wrongful detention claims were thrown out by the district court at the motion to dismiss stage. It is inconceivable at this point that the United States would say that they were required to bring evidence on a, a claim that never made it to the trial court. Uh, they were precluded from bringing any rent testimony on their behalf in their bond proceedings as well. As I noted, this case is not about the wrongfulness of the asylum. It's about the wrongfulness of their detention. Whether or not the petitioners appealed to this asylum decision is not relevant for the purposes of this hearing. Regarding the facts that they settled their Estás condition. hablando muy rápido y entonces se le hace muy difícil a, la, a los traductores. Okay, yes. A sorry, los intérpretes. Sí, por favor, un okay. poquito más despacio. Yes, I apologize. Regarding the fact that they settled their conditions claims for their detention, again, the conditions claims are not at issue today. What's at issue is the wrongfulness of the detention as a whole and the lack of due process that they've suffered over the last two decades. Whether or not claims that are related to this case but are not at issue today is not of relevance to the court and should not be considered. The United States also discussed the fault of the falsification of their documents. This was the fault of their immigration attorney who has already been federally charged and convicted on these claims. He, the way he addressed petitioners was deceitful and he, they were not aware that he was falsifying their documents. Again, this is not of issue for the commission today. I would just like to address that point. Regarding the United States position on the fourth instance formula, both Marcioni and Carranza 
the commission said that a party may bring a claim even if it was issued by a domestic court acting within its competence and under its judicial guarantees, if a possible violation of the convention has occurred and specifically on the right to fair trial. Here, the petitioners are arguing that their right to fair trial has been vi violated and they have sufficiently alleged several violations of the American Declaration both today and in their written testimony. With regard to the United States testimony regarding changes made to Im immigration detention, um, these changes have been made since the brothers' release and they are relevant because they don't address the harms that the brothers suffered. The changes made since 2005 do not make the brothers whole. As they've aptly testified today, the brothers' abuses are long-standing and ongoing and must be remedied by the United States. The United States' refusal to remedy these abuses is part of a pattern of denying justice to individuals harmed by the state's rights abuses post 9-11. Many individuals have attempted to sue the United States and its agents in U.S. courts for the rights violations they have endured during this period. Yet, time and again, domestic courts have used procedural mechanisms to dismiss these claims. This hearing thus represents a unique and singular chance to have these claims heard on their merits, as is so often not the case in domestic courts. This case is also part of an ongoing and increasing effort by the United States to simultaneously re restrict immigrants' ability to assert their rights through the judicial process and to grant immunity to federal government officials that violate those rights. Courthouse doors are closing to non-citizens in the United States who have a right to remedy under both national and international law. The United States is constricting the application of fundamental rights whenever they are linked, however loosely, to questions of immigration or citizenship a clear violation of their obligations under the American Declaration. Thank you. Bueno, muchas gracias. Le voy a dar unos 14 segundos nada más. Eh, le pregunto al Estado si desea hacer eh, uso del derecho a dúplica. Thank you. Um, I, first, I'd like to say that we were in part part of our responses were responsive to things that were said by the petitioners today, so wanted to make that clear. Um, additionally, uh, some of the allegations that have been raised today are about, are beyond the scope of the commission. It appears that petitioners are now trying to make an actio popularis claim, which is beyond the competence of to, uh, the commission to entertain those claims. Um, I'd also, I'd like to turn it back over to my colleague to, to describe a little bit more about additional steps that DHS has taken, in part given um, Ocean's testimony regarding segregation earlier today. Thank you. Uh, thank you um, for the opportunity to give a few follow-up remarks. The, the first thing I want to reiterate is that civil immigration detention is non-punitive. Once a, a non-citizen is transferred into ICE custody, uh, ICE makes a custody determination based on a number of factors um, with limited detention uh, capacity. We use those resources to detain non-citizens to secure their presence for immigration proceedings or for eventual removal from the United States. That includes those whose release is prohibited by law, as provided by the Immigration and Nationality Act, or those that ICE determines would be a public safety risk or a flight risk during the custody determination process. It's very different from uh, criminal detention in that way. And then second, briefly, on the issue of segregation or solitary confinement uh, that petitioners noted in their petition um, uh, that they had been subject to, uh, to, to segregation and detention. U.S. law prohibits the use of special management housing in a manner that would constitute cruel or unusual punishment or without due process of law. The United States remains committed to preventing abuses with regard to detention conditions generally and in particular protecting detained non-citizens from abuses and bringing to justice those who commit them. In September of 2013, after petitioner's detention admittedly, ICE issued a directive on the use of segregation for ICE detained non-citizens, which established enhanced ICE policy and procedures for the review and oversight of decisions to place ICE detained non-citizens in segregated housing for more than 14 days, or for any length of time in response to a health condition or a special vulnerability. This directive enhances reporting requirements, 
and requires ICE to evaluate the appropriateness of continued segregation and to consider potential alternatives. In May of 2020, CRCL launched a periodic review of ICE's segregation oversight program. That review focused on how ICE headquarters and our field offices have implemented the requirements of the directive and the related policies and procedures. And on September 28th of last year, CRCL sent ICE a memorandum with 31 global system-wide recommendations to strengthen ICE oversight of segregation and better protect civil rights and civil liberties. Our segregation policies and oversight were also reviewed by the DHS Inspector General in October of 2021 and the General Government Accountability Office in October of 2022. ICE is currently evaluating the segregation program and considering enhancements and changes in standards and oversight now. Thank you again for this opportunity to address the Commission. Bueno, muchas gracias. Eh, voy a, a, a pedirles a ambas partes que de las preguntas que se van a hacer para tener con el asunto del tiempo, las respuestas pueden presentarse por escrito. Entonces, le voy a dar la palabra a mis colegas para las preguntas a ambas partes. Comisionada Roberta. Thank you, Commissioner. Give me time. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm asking Commissioner Esmeralda to give me time because I have so many questions and so many thoughts, but I'm going to be... I, I can ask you. Yes, you can. Yeah. So you can... Um, but I'll, I'll try to, to be disciplined. Uh, I have uh, some questions for the state and uh, one or two questions for the petitioners. So as I understand it from the brothers, there were two periods of detention. Detention, I believe, in 1999, I think 1999, and then also detention in 2001. The detention in 1999, from what I can understand, was related to immigration irregularities. Is the state's assertion that the, the detention that took place in 2001 also related to immigration ir irregularities? Um, or is it that this detention was also related to allegations of terrorism? So what was the, what is the, what was the cause of the detention in, in 2001, and it was it different from what happened in 1999? If, if charges of terrorism w were also uh, um, invoked to, to justify the detention in 2001, what was the evidence of that terrorism besides the LA cell list to reasonably support the I suppose the, 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 the framing of the detention as part of, of, of terrorism as part of the framing of the detention. And was that evidence supplied to the brothers, the evidence of terrorism besides the LA list and the attendance at the rally, was that um, supplied to the brothers for them to respond to? On the question of the detention, I understand from the state that the detention in the context of immigration irregularities, which is why I come back to the question of what was the purpose of the detention in 2001. But immigration-related um, detention is not meant to be punitive. It's meant to secure the attendance, as I understand it, at immigration hearings. But what we've heard from the brothers seems quite punitive. They are being held in, 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 in facilities with with persons who have been convicted of serious crime. They are being held in facilities where they may not be allowed to leave the lockup for three or four days at a time. This is the testimony that the brothers have given. And that seems punitive because you can hold persons in kind of low security but secure facilities if it's, you know, if it's about <coughs> irregularities. So I'm wondering, and, and, and also uh, thankful to hear the, the, the testimony on enhanced um, policies and the reform of detention conditions, but would you consider, the, as described and maybe as you have investigated, the detention conditions in, between 2001 and 2004? And Five. Five. Would you consider that those conditions of, of, uh, of detention may have crossed the line into cruel and unusual, particularly in the context if they were detained for immigration irregularities. And lastly, um, has there been any state review of charges of discriminatory detention 
on the basis of ethnicity post 9-11 and, and in particular in relation to the four brothers. Thank you. Le paso la palabra a la comisionada Mantilla. Muchas gracias, Presidenta. Uh, thank you very much. I want only two or three things. Uh, for the petitioners, I'd like to know if there is any pending judicial proceedings against the brothers, and what about the status, migratory status, and uh, also if the state, besides the agreement that they have, is there any other kind of support of reparation or remedies? Because all of well, they both both of them mentioned about the impact psychological. So I'd like to know if there is any support for them, you know, for the health. Okay, and in the case of the state, okay, I'm not going to go further about the admissibility. I understand that you disagree, but the commission already admitted the case, so, but just to mention, <laughs> and I'm not going to mention either about the, the competence of the commission, just like to remind, as I always do in the case of the state, about the Phil Artiga Peñera la case, what is very important about the law of nation, but only that. But the thing is, uh, is that um, it really called my attention because there are four brothers, no, it was one or two, it was four. So it's kind of, I'd like to know if there are more situation of cases of brothers and family, all of them, you know, detained. A second thing is that um, what about the migratory status? What about the migratory status of the brothers now? What is the current migratory status now? And just finally to remind that besides the American Declaration of Human Rights, besides the treaties, the non-discriminatory principle is part of the, no, the Jews' cohens. Even the restatement or law of the United States recognize the principle of non-discrimination. Just to remind that. Thank you. Gracias, comisionada. Comisionado Caballero. Sí, muchas gracias, Presidenta. Al, al, a los agentes del Estado. Eh, eh, un poco en la línea de lo que quienes me antecedieron de las, de las comisionadas. Eh, me parecería que hay alguna... Mmm, un intento de distinguir los temas del debido proceso de cualquier otra consideración. Y el tema de, de raza, de origen étnico, de origen nacional, cobra una, una enorme relevancia en estas materias. ¿no? Se ha dicho ahora la comisionada Mantilla, dijo que eran normas imperativas de derecho internacional. Y evidentemente a partir de la declaración americana y del trabajo de los órganos del sistema interamericano de esta comisión, Evidentemente, el debido proceso está, digamos, imbuido en los temas que tienen que ver con la, con la igualdad de grupos tradicionalmente desaventajados, sometidos, excluidos, marginados, y la dificultad de acceder con este acento a las consideraciones de un debido proceso en condiciones de igualdad de armas, se dijera. Entonces, yo escuché ahora lo que han dicho a, a, a partir de, de trabajar en los temas de segregación, etcétera, y el cambio de normas al respecto, pero yo pediría del Estado alguna consideración sobre el procedimiento, los procedimientos judiciales eh, tratados a partir de estas consideraciones, de no discriminación, pero también incluso mm, de posibilidades de igualdad de armas, en el sentido de cómo la condición racial, étnica, origen nacional puede jugar en contra de estos derechos frente a las Cortes en los Estados Unidos. Muchas gracias. Gracias, comisionado. Le voy a dar la palabra al secretario ejecutivo Jorge Mesa. Muchas gracias, eh, presidenta. De manera muy breve y solo para que puedan, eh, si así lo consideran, responderlo por escrito. Entendemos de acuerdo con eh, nuestro registro que hubo un acuerdo eh, extrajudicial eh, con el Estado en donde se recibió alguna reparación vinculada con condiciones de detención. Entonces, saber qué periodo específico abarca, cuál sería la reparación y cuáles serían los aspectos que, de ser el caso, consideran que quedarían pendientes para lograr una reparación integral. Solamente eso, Presidenta. Muchas gracias. Bueno, muchas gracias. Yo solo eh, terminaría eh, señalando la importancia que tiene para la Comisión Interamericana eh, alcanzar el, el, el análisis, el estudio de eh, las peticiones en los términos en los que dentro de nuestras competencias efectivamente podemos, podemos tener. 
eh, me uno a las preguntas que han señalado eh, mis colegas, resaltando eh, de manera muy particular eh, el tema del debido proceso y de, de las reales posibilidades de acceso a la justicia que tuvieron los hermanos en, esta, en, este, en este desarrollo de la búsqueda de su regulación migratoria. Eh, para concluir, quisiera agradecer la participación de la delegación del ilustre Estado de Estados Unidos a la distinguida representación de las presuntas víctimas, recordándoles que tienen un plazo de 30 días a partir del día de hoy para presentar sus observaciones escritas y de esta manera damos por terminada esta audiencia. Muchas gracias.